Prepare to have your head spin. Uh, again? The coastline paradox argues that any single coastline can have different lengths and reaching a definitive length is basically impossible. In a satellite image of a country, the clear outline of a country against the ocean is defined by its coastline. But the closer you zoom in, the more ambiguous it becomes. That's because coastlines have fractal properties, like fjords and bays. A straight line is defined by the shortest distance between two points, so length will all depend on the units of measurement. Using centimeters to measure the length of a curve will get a bigger number than using meters or miles, which would miss out on all the small details. As an example, Australia is said to have a coastline of 12,500 kilometers, but the CIA's World Factbook has it listed as 25,760 kilometers. That's an over 13,000 kilometer difference for the same landmass. Look up the measurement problem, it's a, it's a mind twister. The paradox of the court dates all the way back to ancient Greece. The story goes that the philosopher Protagoras agreed to teach Euthyphus law with an agreement that Euthyphus would pay for the lessons after he won his first case. But after finishing his training, Euthyphus decided he didn't want to be a lawyer and wouldn't pay. So Protagoras sued him and argued to the court that if he wins, Euthyphus would have to pay him by court order. But if he loses, Euthyphus would still have to pay because he'll have won his first case. But Euthyphus counter argues that if he wins, he wouldn't have to pay because of the court ruling, and if he loses, he won't have to pay because he will have lost his first case. The paradox arises with the use of counter dilemma in response to the initial dilemma. Did you catch all that? Rewind it, play it back if you need it, but it's a good one. The unstoppable force paradox dates back to the Chinese philosopher Han Fizi in the 3rd century BC who wrote what happens when an unstoppable force meets an immovable object? He presented the conundrum of a man selling an indestructible shield and a spear that could pierce any object. When asked what would happen if the spear hit the shield, the seller had no answer. This paradox assumes unstoppable forces with infinite torque and immovable objects with infinite mass are separate entities. But these are self-contradictory since each should cancel each other out. If you have an unstoppable force, an indestructible object cannot exist. But if you have an indestructible object, an unstoppable force cannot exist. And basically the only reasonable answer I see is that both forces would just explode. Kind of like my brain just did. The physicist Erwin Schrödinger devised this thought experiment to dispute the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics and quantum superposition, which states that any physical object can exist in all possible states at the same time. The experiment consists of a cat in a steel box with a Geiger detector, a small amount of radioactive material, a vial of poison, and a hammer. But don't go trying this at home, it's just a thought experiment. Once the Geiger detects the radioactive substance, the hammer will break the vial of poison killing the cat. But because radioactive decay is random, there's no way to predict when the cat will actually die. So as long as the box is sealed, the paradox has it that the cat is both equally alive and dead. Schrodinger disagreed with the premise in large objects and believed that it would only work in tiny things like electrons. Galileo's paradox is about the possible infinite series of square numbers. In mathematics, if a set is finite, it contains a finite number of elements. However, if a set is infinite, like natural numbers are, it can go on forever. 
There are more natural numbers than square numbers, but the paradox has it that there has to be the same number of both. Galileo used an infinite series of positive integers and a subset of square numbers. Some numbers are squares, but not all of them, so the total of the numbers must be more than the amount of squares. But every square has a positive number that is the square's root, and every number has one square. So you can't have more of one than the other, and the subset can also be infinite. Basically, the paradox uses the one-to-one -one correspondence, and Galileo concluded that less, greater, and equal to can only be applied to finite sets and not infinite sets. Okay, that one hurt my brain. Hopefully you followed it. If you didn't, Google it. It's really interesting. In artificial intelligence, there's been an assumption that creating simulated reasoning will be difficult, but low-level skills will be easy to design. Moravec's paradox was first proposed in the 1980s by a group of engineers, including Hans Moravec, who were researching AI. They argued that very little work is actually needed to develop reasoning in robots and get them to do tasks that we consider to require high intellect, like playing chess and doing well on IQ tests. It turns out, actually trying to get robots to perform the simple sensory tasks that we do subconsciously are the biggest challenges and also require the biggest computing requirements. This is because they're the hardest to successfully reverse engineer. Essentially, it's the opposite of our logic. Exhibiting adult level performance on intelligence tests is easy and giving them the skills of a child for perception and mobility is actually hard. The problem of evil is believed to have been originated by the Greek philosopher Epicurus and is based on traditional theology that has been debated by theologians and philosophers for centuries. It's a trilemma based in logic that argues, firstly, God exists and is all-knowing, all-powerful, and all-loving, also known as omniscient, omnipotent, and omnibenevolent. Second, there's evil in the world. And third, that if the second is true, then such a God does not and can not exist. The paradox arises when you consider that this God cannot coexist with evil. The argument goes that if there's evil in the world, then God is not all-encompassing and all-loving and by extension doesn't exist. But if there is a God who is both these things, then evil cannot exist. For both God and evil to exist would be a logical contradiction. The potato paradox is a veridical paradox, which means that the result seems ridiculous and impossible, but math is sneaky and can logically be demonstrated to be true. To understand this paradox, imagine you have a pile of 100 pounds of potatoes. So basically, you're in heaven, and for the sake of this example, those potatoes are made up of 99% water and 1% pure potato. Overnight, some of the water evaporates so that the next day, they're only 98% water. So how much do they weigh now? Well, get ready to have your brain mashed because the answer is 50 pounds. The reason for this is kind of simple. If pure potato weight is one pound, which is 1% 1 of 100 potatoes, then 2% must be 50 because for the percentage to be doubled, the total weight has to be half as much. Oh man, I think I'll stick to french fries. Gabriel's horn is named after the Archangel Gabriel, whose horn was associated with the divine and by extension all that is infinite and finite in the world. Follow me on this. It all starts when 1 over x is plotted with x equaling 1 to x equaling infinity, all while rotating around the x-axis, which forms a geometric figure in the shape of a horn. Now the horn has infinite surface area because from the large opening the horn gets it's continually smaller and smaller, going on forever without ever closing. But despite this, mathematically, it also has finite volume. This becomes known as the painter's paradox when you consider painting the horn. The paradox has it that because the volume of the horn is finite, you could fill the horn with a finite amount of paint. But in contradiction to this, a finite amount of paint would not be enough to paint the entire interior surface area because it's infinite. <laughs> oh, we're still recording. Sorry, I think my brain broke. 
The Penrose Triangle or Penrose Tri-Bar is a paradox illusion or an impossible image. It was first designed in 1934 by the Swedish artist Oskar Rudisvard and made popular in the 1950s by the mathematician Roger Penrose and were common in the work of the artist M.C. Escher. The image of the triangle is essentially an optical illusion that is impossible to reason. At first glance, it appears to be a two-dimensional triangle drawn as a three-dimensional object. But, despite what Labyrinth would have you believe, no 3D object could fit the dimensions it's been given. That's because the perspective of the image is shifted to a contradicting position within the same image. Both perspectives are equally represented and you can view it both ways, but you can't make sense of both perspectives at the same time and so it becomes ambiguous. Okay, headache achieved, let's wrap it up. I really hope you enjoyed this. If you did, hit the like button, let me know you care. On the right, you'll find two of my most recent videos that you can go to right now if you want more. And subscribe because I'll have a brand new video for you tomorrow at 3 Eastern Standard Time. I'll see you then.